Um, tonight's event uh, is one of a series of events over six months that are going to take place at the FCCT uh, and other venues featuring Nobel Prize uh, winners and other notable guests. Uh, uh, among them uh, is uh, Ramos Horda, Foreign Minister of East Timor, who has won the Nobel Prize, and Indian uh, Nobel Prize laureate uh, V.S. Napol. And without any further delay, uh, on behalf of the FCCT and the International Peace Foundation, I would like to introduce our main speaker for tonight, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. <laughs> Reverend Jackson is one of America's foremost political figures. Uh, he began his career during the 1960s in the civil rights movement as an assistant to Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, he ran for president twice in the United States, in 1984 and uh, 1988, and broke new ground in American politics by helping the Democratic Party regain control of the Senate. In 1990, Reverend Jackson was elected to the Senate representing Washington, D.C. He has acted as an international diplomat on several occasions, having to secure, helping to secure the release of catch, captured U.S. Navy Lieutenant Robert Goodman from Syria and dozens of Cuban political prisoners in the 1980s. Reverend Jackson has been awarded more than 40 honorary doctorate degrees and is the founder and president of Rainbow Push Coalition, an advocacy organization to promote social justice and equality. The International Peace Foundation, the co-sponsor of this event, is a Vienna-based nonprofit organization under the patronage of 21 winners of the Nobel Peace Prize. This evening's program is part of an event series Bridges, uh, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, organized by the Foundation and taking place in Bangkok, Chiang Mai, Konkan, and Konkan. Uh, Reverend Jackson will be talking also at Tabasad University on Thursday at 2 o'clock for those who didn't have a chance to come here and see him. Uh, and his theme for tonight is Can the U.S. Become a Force for Peace After uh, the War in Iraq? I would like to welcome Reverend Jackson I understand. My sincere thanks for this opportunity to be with you tonight and to be a part of this uh, Bridges uh, Conference. I want to thank two very special participants in this conference who in fact is chairing it and making it possible uh, from Lichtenstein, Prince Alfred, please stand. And Princess Raffaella, please stand. The man who's worked so diligently to uh, facilitate this trip. Uber, will you stand where you? Give my hand, please. And to our, our host, Costas Paris, again, thank you very much. Um, give Costas a big hand. I want to introduce our um, uh, political director in California, Butch Wing. Raise your hand, Butch. And our uh, international affairs director from, um, uh, really by way of, of Africa and Washington now, from, uh, oh, will you please stand, James? James. James is from uh, the Gambia. Uh, let me say tonight that uh, it's good to be in this part of the world again in my travels in time 
we've been to on the, several occasions to Japan and uh, Indonesia and South Korea and the Philippines. Uh, never quite made it over to Bangkok before, but it's been a most uh, exciting, enlightening trip, and I look forward to returning again, particularly the walk in the park earlier this morning. All the excitement in the park and the health exercises for life I found to be <clears throat> a most uh, enlightening, inspiring uh, national policy. We're in a uh, period of uh, profound challenge and transition in our own country and, uh, and in the world. Uh, not long ago, the big debate in America was what should one do with the peace dividend? What would you do with the surplus? We had um, a net gain of 22 million jobs. Now we have a net loss of 4 million jobs. Every state has realized a net loss of jobs. Texas alone, 192,000 job loss. South Carolina, another southern state, <clears throat> a net loss of 80,000 jobs. And so the impact of job loss is affecting American life very much. We've gone from surplus to deficit. Uh, and what was a trillion and a half dollar surplus is now a $500 billion deficit. Our states are now facing unfunded mandates. And while there is a net loss of manufacturing and middle class jobs, while jobs are on the decline, the cost of college tuition has gone up 40%. And while there is some talk about economic recovery, it is recovery without, without jobs. And that's like a swimming pool without water. It does not stand to reason. Uh, and so there is a, a growing body of poverty-stricken Americans. 50 million Americans now have no health insurance. A coal miner dies every six hours from black lung disease and a rash of a pattern, really, <clears throat> of second-class schools and, and first-class jails. Tremendous investment in the jails for profit industrial complex. Today, there are 950,000 young black men in jail and 600,000 in college. In every state, more blacks in jail and more Hispanics in jail than there are in college. And in the face of this loss of jobs <clears throat> and loss of, of life options, the corporations are dumbing down health benefits uh, and, and in fact eliminating jobs. And of course that creates this tremendous tension, some of which is with the Pacific Rim and we'll get to that a bit, a bit later tonight. But this, uh, this, this drop from peace dividend and surplus to war budget and deficit is having its impact upon the psyche of the American uh, people. We, in these last three years, uh, Mr. Bush nor Mr. Ashcroft, neither has met with civil rights leadership nor labor, nor the Congressional Black Caucus as a group one time. There's a closed door policy. The Congressional Black Caucus of 38 members of the U.S. Congress have sought to meet with him. The NAACP has met with every president since Warren Harding. Uh, organized labor cannot get a meeting with him. So there's a profoundly ideological uh, administration with very clear lines of ideology, very much driven by by right-to-work laws, driven by states' rights, 
uh, in part this economic crisis <clears throat> is not just driven by 9-11. 9-11 cannot be the catch-all for all of our crisis. After all, these massive tax cuts for the top 1% and benefit cuts for working people preceded 9-11. Uh, the top 1% got half the trade and a half dollar uh, benefit. Uh, in this ideology, uh, which is so pro so pro profit and so anti labor, um, corporations are allowed to go offshore to avoid paying taxes, and uh, then get no bid contracts. Uh, and to that extent, that says much about the trade policy uh, for this region of the world. The use of the expansive consumer base and labor-based and technology-based in this part of the world to play it often against the American market and create uh, attentions that we must relieve uh, and address in years to come. Uh, often I work in this region um, uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, I've been blessed to bring Americans home from foreign jails on four different occasions, or really five. One, we were able to appeal to Assad and convince him to release Lieutenant Robert Goodman from jail in Syria. The down white pilot died, and so we did not gain his release. He was dead. And then we were able to convince Castro to release 48 Cuban and Cuban Americans, able to convince uh, Saddam Hussein in 1990 to release 600 women, mostly American, but some from Canada and France and Britain, uh, and to not use them as human shields. We tried to convince him, likewise, he should pull back from his occupation of Kuwait in that uh, border battle. He did not, and of course, he invited war upon himself. But we did convince him to release those persons and brought them back to their respective countries. And then two years ago, convinced Milosevic to release three American soldiers who had been captured uh, in that war. And then uh, able to get some uh, British journalists freed who had been caught in a crossfire between Sierra Leone and, uh, and Liberia. And in these uh, ventures to bring Americans back home and seek to release prisoners, it's always been a kind of trivializing of, of how we did it, as if either we were lucky and not thinking, or those who released them were sinister and manipulating us for their ends. The fact is, it was always of some mutual benefit because we knew that relieving, releasing prisoners was a way to open some wonderful dialogue. Matter of fact, we brought um, Lieutenant Robert Goodman back home from Syria. President Reagan, uh, upon my appeal, called President Saad and thanked him for the release. The first time, and maybe the last time they ever talked. But at least it was an attempt to break open uh, that, that closed shutter and open some dialogue. Um, and yet, when we brought uh, Goodman back home, I expected the media to ask me, what was the dynamic? How did I convince uh, him to let the American prisoners go? After all, they were not there as tourists. They were there as soldiers. Uh, well, number one, uh, the f first thing I did to get him back was I tried. And that had not been done. I, I tried. Uh, and secondly, I, I, I talked with him. I was not afraid of his face. But invariably, in all four of those countries, there was a, a diplomatic disconnect, uh, an intelligence deficit, abounding poverty, and underestimation of the power of their indigenous religious leadership and a sense that uh, we were above the need for a mutually beneficial 
mutual, mutually respectful relationship. And so here we are tonight in the midst of a, a sinking feeling in America. It is a sinking feeling economically and a sinking feeling in, in foreign policy. On this matter of, um, of Iraq, uh, we now are facing a very difficult situation. We went in unilaterally and maybe arrogantly. We'll have to come out in coalition and perhaps humbly. And both coalition and humility will be difficult for this administration. And yet we went in alone, but we cannot stay in alone. And we cannot survive alone in this, in this guerrilla warfare. Uh, the whole world, when we were hit September 11th, Cuba, Libya, the non-aligned, NATO, UN, the whole world said we must stop this terrorist hit coming out of Afghanistan. We know what the Taliban is. We know who Bin Laden is. After all, we got the receipts from the weapons he has. We really know who he is, and we have to stop him. And then the president, who had engaged in isolationist policies, uh, not going to the UN conference on racism in South Africa, and the Kyoto Treaty, saying my way or the highway, that same tendency sent us into Iraq, uh, splitting Europe, undermining the UN, and going it alone. It was a short war, but now a long battle. And we were prepared for the high-tech Nintendo war, but not prepared for the battle. Even at home, there's 6,000 American veterans who cannot get proper medical assessment or medical treatment. Uh, it is as extreme as when those bodies come home this week, uh, they will not allow the American media to cover the caskets coming in. Nor will the Pentagon release the pictures of, the, uh, of those who are dead, trying to dumb down the sensitivities of the American people. But uh, the press, has, which was embedded with the government in this war, is now on a kind of rebound facing the fact that we're in for a, a long uh, and tragic stay. Uh, and I hope that soon that we will come to grips with the, perhaps the only way out, it is to appeal to France and Germany and China under the rubric of the UN to work with us in a mutually power-sharing relationship. They will not come in under any other condition. Uh, in that way, the U.S. alone is seen as an occupying force. Just maybe that arrangement would be seen as a liberating and mitigating force. Uh, we need to relieve that pressure because just as we became engulfed so deeply in Vietnam with faulty assumptions underestimating the will of the people, those same faulty assumptions that um, people would be dancing in the streets upon our arrival and dancing to the tune of dropping bombs. That was such faulty uh, assessment. Uh, and so in some sense, that's why this peace conference in this region takes on great meaning for us because issues of, uh, of, of peace uh, and war, issues of a global family, uh, that is where we are tonight. And uh, I'm anxious to be a part of some of some dialogue. I feel the the air conditioner, and I feel coasters breezing down my back. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Reverend Jackson. Um, we're going now into questions and answers. Um, please identify yourself before asking your question, uh, and do not make a speech. We are all anti-war in here. Uh, you don't have to say, you don't have to tell it personally to Reverend Jackson. So ask a question, don't make a speech. Uh, could we start with the first question, please? You have to cue behind the microphone to get a question. My name is Kim Izo, represent Radio Free Asia, and I work for Burmese Service. 
Uh, Reverend, I saw in your itinerary you are going to Mesau tomorrow and also going to visit Burmese refugee. And uh, I would like to know what kind of message are you going to give them? Well, we do go to the border tomorrow to the um, refugee camp with Burmese, Burmese. Uh, because those persons who have uh, been fleeing for their lives um, and who are now in Thailand, uh, ultimately, uh, they have a natural right to live in Burma in peace and security. They feel they can't. They have an international, they have an international right to be here until they can get back home under those conditions. And that's where the UN will play a huge role in bringing to them uh, the relief that they deserve and to afford them human rights. And to work with both governments, one, to in time repatriate them. But until political conditions change, that is not feasible. So in that they are here, they must receive humane treatment and accommodations according to international law. So we go to meet with them tomorrow to bring them some hope and to appeal to both governments to afford them humane treatment and to afford, and appeal to Kofi Annan at the UN to get them the, uh, the supplies and the status that they need. Next question, please. student at the International School of Bangkok and I would like to know what do you think my generation will play in the future of peacekeeping? Well, I contrast it when um, I was much younger, I was jailed in uh, <laughs> Greensboro, North Carolina trying to use a, uh, in Greenville, South Carolina trying to use a uh, the public library and then jail trying to use uh, other facilities uh, as we fought the legal laws of apartheid but young America came alive to end the system of legal apartheid and to secure for all Americans their right to vote and ultimately to end the war in Vietnam that's what that generation did uh, the struggle continues. The one thing that you have today, we didn't have then, you have the right to vote. You have the right to make and break Congress people and presidents. Indeed, you have the right to run for office. There is a growing youth movement in America, A, to stop the war in Iraq on these terms, and if you will, to lower tuition costs for students. <laughs> because tuition costs itself is driving students out of school. Matter of fact, today, there are 5.6 million American youth between 16 and 24 out of school and out of work. 5.6 million. 100,000 in Chicago alone. A huge youth population that needs alternative <laughs> education and skill training education. And that, needs a, and that needs a job. And so forth, there is a plan, there's a policy, an $87 billion a budget now, to reconstruct Iraq. Its roads, its bridges, its sewers, its schools. But no plan no, of reconstruction for urban or rural America. No such plan to reconstruct life options for young America. And that's why in 2004, will have the great opportunity in America to vote again and the, and the winner win this time. <laughs> uh, will, we, uh, will we get a chance to uh, vote for Jesse Jackson in 2008? That's not on the present radar screen. Don't create that crisis over here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm you know, sometimes much of our leadership has to come outside that circle. So often our politicians get caught 
all trying to fit into a keyhole rather than a door trying to uh, engage in uh, political gestures that do not open up the process. I mean, Dr. King was not an elected official, and yet it was his work that helped to transform the entire country and culture. And much of our work today uh, addressing the fair trade policies and environmental policies and child labor policies and gender equality policies and, and peace policies come outside of that system and uh, uh, there will be there is a credible body of people running for that office but right now I want to spend a lot of time on building a human rights movement within our country to inspire people who have dropped out to register and vote and to participate and put really renewed focus on shared economic security uh, and and a peace policy or uh, should I say a foreign policy it's not foreign to our values. When I flew over here the other day from Chicago to LA to Hong Kong to Bangkok, every time I look at the airplane, look at the plane, uh, you'd see uh, Thai Airlines, uh, Singapore, uh, American Airlines, United, uh, uh, Ethiopia, some airline, and you see these airline, these pilots walking down the hall with their with their flight crews, and the reason why that there was no crashes in the sky. Because there's, there's some international law, some international governance, some common set of rules. And no matter what the language may be, the message is the same, that there are rules that all must honor to have a safe global airway. That's true for a global economy. There must be some shared rules and some shared values. Our foreign policy presently is foreign to our core values. There must be a commitment to international law and to human rights and self-determination and economic justice and consistency. You can't very well trade with China and ignore Cuba on ideological grounds. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Lawrence Alexander from Orlando, Florida. And very nice to see you here in <laughs> Thailand, Reverend. Good, good, good. One of the most effective ways to bring about change and better understanding among people of the world and also people within the United States is through effective communication. And I was aware of the fact that our president did not meet with the Congressional Black Caucus. But I was not aware of the fact that he did not meet with labor unions and other persons. What would you suggest that we as Americans can do to see to it that there is more effective communication between our citizens and our president? Well, what is uh, significant, I think in some sense, the genius of our country, no matter how difficult the struggles are in America, um, in America, you have the right to fight for the right. We lost every major election in the South in, 19, in year 2000 by the margin of unregistered black voters, uh, uninspired. We still have the coalition capacity in America to put in an administration whose choice of cabinet members, whose choice of judges, and whose global vision will take us out of the quagmire that we are now trapped in, in Iraq. Uh, one who will have enough cultural sensitivity to not be talking about evil empire, which itself undercuts the art of diplomacy and dialogue. That to even to say evil empire shows a certain uh, deficit of diplomatic appreciation. <laughs> Because it is our it is our duty to to talk with people. It is our duty to uh, to neutralize our enemies, and when we can, to convert them, and expand what, uh, relations with our friends. You can't do that with kind of uh, street talk, name calling. Bring them on. Uh, we've kind of gone, you know, as Maureen Dowd says, from uh, Baghdad Bob, comic Ali, to Crawford George. And it's Crawford 
Texas, George. And uh, remember during that war that, that Baghdad, uh, Bob, I think they call him Comic Ali, would say, America is not coming and we're winning every day. And President Bush said he would go out and watch TV and just watch, you know, with some relief, Baghdad, Bob, say we're not coming and we were already there. Well, it was a joke, man, but now, every time an American is killed, President Bush said, they're killing us because they're scared of us. And, uh, and they are, uh, they're resisting us because they're desperate, they're desperate. And they're just killing us and, and injuring us. And the world is isolating us. And yet there is a spin of glee with every, every injury and every, and every death. We need clearer broader leadership than this. And I think next year will be a great showdown in American history. Next question, please. Jeannie. Good evening, Reverend Jeannie Halsey from the FCCT. I have a two-part question. A colleague who just returned from Iraq yesterday, who was exhausted but wanted to be here, asked on his, to me, for me to ask on his behalf if you could expound upon the connection between the acquisition of oil and the premise for the invasion and continued occupation of Iraq. And number two, if you could, on my behalf, the question would be, if you could please tell us what your answer would be to the widespread perception that the general American public have little participation and there's a sense of apathy in terms of actually participating in any efforts to make the United States government accountable for its actions in Iraq. Well, many Americans, many Americans always thought that that was Operation Iraq Liberation, which spells oil. Operation Iraq Liberation. And when the bombs were dropping, the only ministry left standing was the petroleum ministry. Uh, museums and libraries and museums of great antiquity and art were destroyed, bombed, looted, but the petroleum ministry was protected, which kind of further fed that notion. Uh, but it went a, went a step beyond that. We were told, and many Americans led to believe, without evidence, that Iraq was an imminent threat. There were weapons of mass destruction, which we now think were weapons of mass deceit. And there was the Al-Qaeda-Saddam uh, connection. None of that is proven to be true. Now we're saying those reasons don't matter, that that's another set of reasons now stop terror. The fact is we all should fight to stop terror, except now Iraq has become the international headquarters of this religious and terror resistance to U.S. occupation uh, and to Britain. It's made our world a, um, a more dangerous world tonight. So at least when Saddam was there, uh, as despicable as much of his acts were, he was contained. The U.S. and Britain uh, controlled 60% of the airspace. He couldn't and was not going to attack Iran or Syria or the Persian Gulf, uh, nor Europe, nor America. He was contained. Now we have uh, uh, created a whole sense of chaos and disorder. Uh, and we have no defense against the guerrilla warfare in that country. We're paying a huge price in blood and money with no end, with no end in sight. And we can only hope that, uh, that uh, American people will begin to rebound. I think one reason why there was so much activity in Europe, there was a free press. The, the European press gave more valid information. I would say if, if this room, if there were no oxygen in this room, and uh, after a while, we begin to affect our behavior, we begin to fall asleep, and you begin to see strange actions because there was no oxygen. Uh, and we cannot survive without oxygen. In that sense, we cannot survive without information like oxygen to the brain. I mean, Americans were asphyxiated because our major media was in, in bed with 
call him embedded in bed with <laughs> in bed with the war machine. Uh, today our tank rolled in. Today uh, our bombs dropped. We took a sense of possession of this Nintendo war uh, that we engaged in preemptively. But now there is a kind of coming uh, awake. The American media is saying, why can't the American cameras cover the soldiers' caches coming home at Dover Air Base? Why can't the Post and New York Times and AP get pictures of the dead, uh, you know, for the papers? Why are there 6,000 wounded, many of them at Fort Stewart, Georgia, and Fort Knox in Kentucky, who do not yet have medical assessments, who need surgery and cannot get surgery? Why is it that many American soldiers were coming back home from Iraq to Washington and then had to pay their way home, said they lived in Oregon or lived in California? Why was there no plan to, in fact, give the American veterans to support that their family deserve. So that is, to that extent, to that extent, that is uh, great uh, American public is beginning to come alive across political lines, I might add. Where you fall against the war is one position. But how we're treating our veterans, indeed our wounded from this war, is a great source of shame and disgrace. Next question, please. Um, my name is Karishma Vyas, and I'm representing myself. Um, I have two questions. Do you believe, in your opinion, do you believe the so-called Jewish lobby has a disproportionate influence on American foreign policy? And? And uh, do you believe the current administration is on the right path towards achieving Middle East peace? Well, I do not think that, I, I think that the uh, Jewish lobby idea is, is not sound thinking. I think it feeds into a kind of threatening, frightening anti-Semitism that does not lend itself to us finding solutions. For example, the people driving this policy, what it is, President Bush, uh, Cheney, uh, Rumsfeld, um, or, or what it is, Tom DeLay in Texas, none of them are Jewish. Those who are driving this policy, the Halliburton forces, uh, given these no-bid contracts, uh, Halliburton and um, uh, Bechtel, uh, and so, I mean, one must not reduce our pain and the tyranny of it uh, to one group. I don't think it's accurate. I don't think it's accurate. I don't think it's fair. And I think it serves no socially useful purpose to feed into that idea. I mean, those who are now being used to articulate this war, uh, I think in a manipulative way, are black and brown. When the war was going on, you had uh, General Brooks kind of seen as in the lineage of Colin Powell, he was a spokesman. And then you had Sanchez, the Hispanic, he was the spokesman. And then that was the international face of the war. And then back home, you had Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell going to each network TV every Sunday. Those were the faces of that war. Uh, and since you couldn't see the faces of the killed and the injured in the paper, it, it kind of it kind of blunted the edge of the true nature of the soldiers. For example, in the army, 50% of the women are black. In the army, the male 35% black and 15% Latino. Uh, those in the war are disproportionately poor people, whether white, black, or brown, because we don't have a draft system. Men of the working poor patriots join the military for a job to travel and get an education but the most able Americans go to the big universities. For them, the war is academic because it does not affect their lives. There are no cashes coming back to Harvard, or Yale, or Princeton, or Columbia, or Berkeley, or UCLA. And I say, to me, these, these forces, uh, these uh, facts must be addressed in ways that does not lend themselves to uh, 
in the, I think in a kind of creeping after semitism. I hope that does not happen. What about the second question? Middle East, Reverend Jack. Which was? Which was, do you think the current administration is on the right path to achieving Middle East peace? No. <laughs> uh, for the first year, they spent their time trying to discredit, discredit the efforts of Bill Clinton, which had a real meaningful dialogue process taking place. Um, and then when the uh, West Bank settlement expanded, Bush said to Sharon, uh, stop it. And Sharon didn't stop it. And there were no consequences of that. And so that process kind of kept going. Uh, and after too many more deaths, they began to emerge talking about some roadmap to peace arguing that if you cut the head off in Iraq, uh, the near, you would then have the, the, the entry to the road map would be through Baghdad. All of that has unraveled. That is not proven to be true. And, uh, and today, without direct involvement and real hard work and, and risky work, we'll not achieve peace there. And that was the value of what Bill Clinton was doing by by himself being the chief diplomat. The chief uh, diplomat he was operating more as diplomat than command than chief. Chief was using the office to power, much like Carter did with Begin and Arafat, using the power of his office because the reality is that the Israelis and Palestinians are trapped in a death grip, driven by lots of fear, lots of history, lots of hatred, lots of violence, lots of blood. And neither can turn the other or loose. They cannot trust to release the grip. Only some honest broker, honest broker, who can break them apart and gain the mutual trust and give them benefits for breaking the death grip can happen. That cannot happen by a low-level diplomat. Can happen by email and fax. That requires real hard or risk your leadership, but the, but the reward is worth the risk in my judgment. But President Clinton, Reverend Jackson, uh, really didn't achieve much despite his high level efforts. Uh, do you think there is a chance for Middle East peace as long as the Prime Minister of Israel is Sharon and Yasser Arafat is the head of the Palestinian Authority? Well, we didn't have Middle East peace before the present Prime Minister. Uh, the, the key to it would be not just new leaders, but a new formula. A new formula. And that new formula means a, a two-state solution. Uh, when I raised this in 1979, that that should be uh, a two-state solution. I was uh, roundly attacked by the median of the forces. But it was clear then that you were going to have coexistence or co-annihilation that you had to have a mutual recognition policy. So we kind of made it up to that point. But then that beyond the, the handshake, the settlements must stop. Uh, and walls must be replaced by bridges. And a struggle to disarm, not to create more arms, because more guns and I mean, one group is using bombs, one using uh, suicide bombs. It's going to take some heavy lifting to break that cycle. And right now, uh, we have not seen effective uh, results from what I think have been uh, low-level efforts for too long. Jim Stein from SBS Australia Television. There's been a growing call in the United States for, for troops to come home, for America to pull out of the US. What's your view? Well. American troops are not welcome there, will never be able to take up residence there. Uh, American troops cannot pull out unilaterally um, because we will betray those who are allied with us in the process. And that would invite them to a, uh, to a bloodbath. Uh, the quagmire is that we can't leave and we can't stay. We can't leave and we can't stay. So what do we do? Well, we went in unilaterally, unilaterally and arrogantly. How do we get out? 
I said earlier, the only way out as I see it is to convince France and Germany and China to coalesce with us under the UN umbrella. The U.S. is seen as, um, as an occupying force, the, uh, which is meets stiff resistance. Uh, and now provoking a lot of Muslim anti-Americanism, real organized anti-Americanism. The UN, the UN could possibly be seen as, the, um, as a liberating force and could create the order because only that body now, with France and Germany and China in the mix, only that body has the credibility. Uh, our present, present uh, posh in Iraq uh, has been discredited. And, and for us to try to set up a, a kind of council leaders and determine the outcome on our terms simply will not work. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jackson, for your lucid and um, harmonious, you know, rather than fighting, but to find that middle way. Uh, my question is kind of the other side of what the young lady preceding. Do you think that the policy of the Bush administration is effective to accomplish, uh, successfully to accomplish war in the Middle East? In that it looks to me like, and I have not seen this brought up before, that the whole Muslim, which is not a rel just a religion, but it's a socio-economic political structure that is very parallel with the communist, with the socialist, with the labor. And this looks to me like it might just be something that they want to bury that whole thing to and to open up this whole mass market to the capitalistic uh, expansion. And if you have something to say on that, I'd appreciate it. Well, a few days ago, one of our officials uh, said a very disparaging remarks about Muslims um, and was defended rather than fired uh, and should have been fired just to send that signal of sensitivity much like the president's idea by Christian crusade which itself sent those same kind of those same kind of bad signals um, I, I, I'm rather convinced now that in these uh, coming days that we must uh, seek to convince our allies who are Muslim that we're sensitive, that we're caring, that we're respectful of their traditions. Because, well, there is this one-sixth of those living in the surplus, five-sixths those living in the deficit. There is this north-south tension there are some civilizational class components to this issue, too, in terms of uh, what this region sees of America's much decadent degenerative TV performances, which does not really reflect, you know, all of America. But many people find it distasteful, while others find it to be exciting. But there is great cultural resistance as well as political resistance, the idea that we will go to countries like this one and offer some kind of uh, pacifying trade deal, trade off for, for more military arms and, and bases. There is, no, there is no future in that. Uh, America's greatest strength is not its weapons of war, though they have a role to play, it is the rather intriguing values. The idea that you can have the right to write, the right of free press, uh, uh, the right of public education and public health care, the right to vote, the right to run for office, equal protection under the law and child labor laws and worker labor laws and and gender equality and laws against traffic and women and children, these basic uh, values uh, are, are attractive, uh, far more attractive than our capacity uh, to destroy whole countries by pushing buttons. Uh, what makes us great historically has been our values. 
And that's why this idea of preemptive strike, you see, goes against the best of the, of the American experience. And I hope that the next administration will return to those basic um, and core cool values. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Jackson, my name is Dave Walker. I'm a screenwriter from Canada. I was just wondering of your thoughts on the Patriot Act and its consequences for America. Disastrous. Because really it's, a, it's an unpatriot act. It's kind of like right to work laws mean the opposite. It's manipulation of language, you know. Uh, the idea that we're going to fight uh, terrorism by the right to invade people's private computers and to get a read on the books they check out of the libraries, the right to arrest people without charges, the people hold up in Guantanamo even today without charges. Uh, these repressive acts make us liken unto that which we are fighting. And now we're paying a, a heavy toll for driving the American public backwards by fear and cynicism rather than forward by hopes and dreams. On our best days, we're driven forward by hopes and dreams and buoyant optimism. Now we've been driven backwards by fear and cynicism. And the Homeland Security's department, now the largest agency in the whole government, is a fear agency. Last week in Chicago, there was a fire in the downtown building that houses the county, Cook County office workers on maybe 16th or 18th floor. And six people were trapped in stairwells and perished to death. What happened was, well, all every American building now is on the, is on the clamp, you know, is on the, uh, on the tight security. Every airport, every downtown building, every law office, the whole nine yards. And so you can't get in but one way, can't get out but one way. So all the historical fire emergency exits, all the exit signs in case of fire, all of that be damned because now, you know, been late is coming. So when the fire struck and the smoke began to rise, people ran for the, uh, car, for the uh, stairwells, but they were all locked. So people were locked in, the building became a prison. And in part, uh, they, are, they were trapped in a security alert that locked people in the building. So we're giving up some precious freedoms and the, uh, we're getting un unintended consequences. But there is no civil right law that we've known in our lifetime that Ashcroft would have supported. You do know that um, um, uh, Vice President Cheney voted against freeing Mandela from jail. That says volumes of it between Ashcroft and Cheney and their view of civil rights and civil liberties. Um, and then those like Perlman and, and, and uh, Wolfers and those groups who have this awesome power are not elected and unaccountable. And that itself creates uh, a dynamic that is detrimental. Yes, ma'am. Um, sir, I'm Amy Kasman from the Financial Times. There's been talk in the U.S. press that the Bush administration looks defeatable in the next elections, but questions about whether the Democratic Party will be able to get its act together in order to defeat them. I'd like to ask you, basically, what you think the Democratic Party needs to do in order to ensure victory at the next election, and also what the greatest risk for the party is. Thank you. Well, the first thing Democrats must do is make certain that the winner wins. And secondly, that every vote counts. Last time, Mr. Bush won by the margin of stop the count. 27,000 voters in Deval County in Jacksonville. Um, students at Florida and m and Bethune-Cookman, uh, Haitian uh, workers who needed language support, uh, Hispanic farm workers, their votes 
were not counted. He won by stop the count. And in some sense, the same forces that stopped the count in Florida uh, now seek to redistrict in Texas to gain and to recall in California. There's a decided shift to abusive use of government power to maintain control. Uh, under the best conditions in America, American presidents appoint Supreme Court justices. This time the Supreme Court just appointed the president. Turn democracy upside down. Uh, so we have, so Democrat leaders, those who are in the top tier, Dean and Gephardt and Kerry and Clark, they certainly have a big target to shoot at. Because in 19, in 2000, uh, Bush had used personality as, as uh, a substitute for vision. He could contrast his smile with Gore's and ability to smile, and people kind of bought the glow of it all. But now the glow has worn down to a, um, uh, an ember, and there's a record. Now Democrats can ask the question, is our economy better off four years later? Are we more secure four years later? Were we given accurate and good information or proper interpretation of information about Iraq? The answer is, answer is no. So I think that Bush is a big, slow moving target. And the field will begin to narrow really after about February. I think whoever emerges out of that pack is going to be formidable. So far, uh, Dr. Dean has taken the first lead in this race, in part because he was so unequivocal about the, uh, the war in Iraq by moving unilaterally without support of UN and splitting Europe uh, and no end game. He, he is in front in part because he challenged the assumptions of a tax cut for the top 1% where we fed the leaves, watered the leaves, and didn't water the roots bottom up. And he's captured the imagination of many independent voters and young voters and increasingly his uh, substance and style is gaining traction in this race. Would you officially throw your support behind Dr. Dean? I've not made that determination yet and only because I want to spend my time kind of doing what I'm doing now, uh, kind of building a strong resistance movement to the threat to our civil rights and civil liberties, organizing workers, uh, fighting for a peace with honor and justice platform. Uh, you know, in 1960, Kennedy did, that, did not run on the civil rights platform. That came out of Birmingham, not out of Washington. In, in 64, Lyndon Johnson didn't run on the voting rights platform. That came out of Selma, Alabama. So often forces outside the structure can open it up in ways forces inside cannot. And at this point, I choose to run the, uh, the outside track to try to gain uh, within the American public a consciousness to put, the, put demands upon whoever runs. We've lost too many elections by the margin of cynicism and despair. Hope must abound for us to win. Alex? Uh, well, you know, uh, he had an ideological vision and made a huge miscalculation. And my appeal to him to not run, is often political races are won by, by margins, uh, small margins. In 1960, Kennedy beat Nixon by 112,000 votes, less than one vote per precinct. In 1968, Dr. King was killed April the 4th. Robert Kennedy killed June the 5th. There was uh, uh, lots of pain and fear and anger, and it was exploited. Uh, and so uh, many uh, progressives or independents said Humphrey didn't break from Johnson quickly enough, and he may be better than Nixon, but there's no real difference between Nixon and Humphrey. That kind of... Uh, diatribe by progressives and by the margin 
of 500,000 votes. Nixon beat Humphrey. I saw that same scenario coming in 2000, and it did happen. Uh, we won the election, but we could have won by a more comfortable margin uh, had not uh, that candidate occurred in my judgment. Alex? Hello, I'm Alex Spillage from the Daily Telegraph. Um, throughout the world, there's, as, as I'm sure you're aware, um, immense opposition to America and a feeling running through, especially the Muslim world and through the thousands of Euro Europeans who marched against the war that America controls the world and is, has sort of, in the post-war era, been, blamed to, been to blame for everything bad that's happened. Um, a, do you think that's true? And B, it's made me think, can you name one glowing success for American foreign policy? in that era where America did the right thing, especially in the conflict scenario? America, if I can stop with your last question, finally decided to put pressure and sanctions on South Africa to end apartheid, but the pressure came from outside the government. A, 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 a demonstrations for a solid year, we went to jail every day for a year uh, to change the climate against government resistance. Uh, in my 88 address at the Democrat Convention, I said our kinship with South Africa, our treaty with them was a moral disgrace. Our government very reluctantly, with the divorce vote, put sanctions on South Africa. It never occurred to them that they should, that they should invade South Africa and free the masses for democracy. Uh, such action was never on the radar screen but in the end, we did the right thing by joining the Mandela side of Mandela over uh, the Africanas. We did that. Uh, I mean, our support of NATO across these 50-odd years, even that of South Korea, has been sound foreign policy. But this uh, preemptive strike and calling countries uh, evil empires, and this is different. Uh, and this is not helpful. And uh, we deserve better. Was your first question? Well, America does have substantial influence in this world, but like all great empires, uh, pride and arrogance precedes the fall. Um, I, I often remind American audiences that we are a great and a God-blessed nation. But we're one-third of our hemisphere, two-thirds of our neighbors speak Spanish. And yet some American leaders want to make English only as a criteria for education. Just a cultural resistance to two-thirds of our hemisphere. Another 250 million who speak Portuguese in, in Brazil. Uh, half of all human beings are Asian. Half of them are Chinese. One eighth of the human race is African, one fourth Nigerian. There are a billion people in India, twice within the US and Russia combined. When Mr. Bush and Mr. Putin meet, that's a minority meeting. <laughs> they represent one eighth of the human race. Most people in the world tonight are yellow, brown, black, non-Christian, poor, poor, female, young, and don't speak English. That's the real world order. You got that? Yellow, and brown, and black, and non-Christian, and poor, and female, and young, and don't speak English, and poor, and poor, and poor. And uh, we have the capacity to lead that world with our values and our blessed resources, not to intimidate it with our guns. Our guns will not be enough to rule the world. Our values can guide it, but our bombs will not be able to rule it. Uh, it seems that people are more uh, into being uh, inspired by our values <laughs> than threatened by our weapons. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Reverend um, Dwahli Saikau Tao Independent. Um, you are visiting us just after President Bush, 
Pre President Bush's Disneyland tour through Bangkok. And I was wondering, he left asking Thailand for more money, for more troops, more support in his war, in his uh, campaign. I was wondering what you will be asking of Thailand and at Thammasat University, what do you hope to instill in the young uh, Thai people here? People of these impoverished nations they need to spend their money on wiping out malnutrition or to spend their money on universal education, spend their money on comprehensive health care, spend money on an environment to policy that allows us to breathe free and have drinkable water. We'll not be made more secure by pouring more money and more guns into Iraq. And I hope that, that the poorer countries of the world will not trade off status and, um, and a military base for taking care of the needs of their own people. We are spending ourselves as a nation too much money uh, on military. Now think about men of these countries where you, have, you don't have good child labor laws. The idea is that uh, children, we need children to work, keep our economy going. Uh, these countries, children need education. Their future is an enlightened mind and increased productivity. And that comes from child education, not from child labor. Uh, I would hope that uh, this country and others uh, would not trade off their legitimate uh, needs to take care of the underserved in their own countries for investing more money in Iraq. That is not a good expenditure of America's money, and it is a substantially wealthy country Sure, not a good investment for, for poorer countries whose needs are so apparent. Reverend Jackson, my name is John Harger. I'm from New Jersey and Oberlin, but I live in Bangkok. Um, I was in, I'm very pleased to hear your description of your, your diplomatic practices and policies. And I wondered, uh, you also talked about the importance of the UN. So I wondered if we look at Israel, we see a country that has not followed up on what, 60, 65, 67, 68 resolutions from the UN. We see a country that has not allowed itself to be subjected to inspections for weapons of mass destruction or of nuclear weapons. We see a country that refuses to have UN peacekeeping troops provide protection or uh, protection between Palestinian lands and, is and Israeli lands. We find a country that refuses Can to... Can we have the question, John, please? That's the question. Okay. <laughs> we see a country that refuses to, to um, withdraw from occupied territory. So I was wondering, do you feel that you could apply your dip diplomatic skills, perhaps in the context of the UN, to make what has to happen happen before there well, will be all, peace? All nations must abide by international law for their own security and that for the neighbors. Uh, again, I think of these planes flying into Hong Kong and, and Tokyo. If there had been a different set of rules on flight patterns for one country or another, we'd have had airplane clashes in the air. We must come to grips with one set of rules, and that applies with the U to U.S., or Israel, or Britain, or France, or any other country. Um, you know, when there are the Athletic Olympics every four years, on the field, you know, is Thailand and China and Hong Kong and France and Britain, the U.S. and the Caribbean Islands and the like, and there's this, there are these huge contests who can run the race, who can throw the shot put, who can shoot the basketball. And at the end, there are gold and silver, bronze winners and losers. But we all have a sense of fairness, that there are never riots about Olympic results. 
Uh, and in that arena, you see, you know, Yao from China becomes America's number one basketball draw. Uh, Sammy Sosa from Dominican Republic becomes the big draw in baseball. How can we have, in the metaphor of athletics, so much excitement and, and uh, no war? Because whenever you have an even playing field, and the rules are public, and the goals are clear, we can make it. And I say, the family of nations, that we must even the playing field uh, and have public rules and clear goals. One thing I observed is that the top ones, the top one sixth in the surplus culture, the biggest threat to them is, that, is to speak of equality. They have no interest in equality. They want privilege, inheritance, and transgenerational wealth. No interest in equality. And yet, there will not be peace until lion and lamb lie together. And what's in that biblical metaphor is that lions are greedy, and they eat lambs for sport. And lambs are meat and can't run fast. And what would make lions and lambs lie together? Under what conditions would they co sign a contract and both of them honor it? What do lions and lambs have in common? Well, neither want the forest to catch on fire. Neither want the acid rain on their back. We must keep fighting until we find that common ground where Israel and Palestinians uh, America and Thailand find common ground on the one big tent. And that is the supreme effort that this generation must put forth. Thank you. Yes, sir. Andrew Jones, Green World Technology. I have a, I have a question for you about what your opinion is on the base causes of the conflict in Iraq now. As a, as a religious person, and head of an international peace foundation, peace, peace organization, what are your ideas to break the cycle of the religious hatreds that may be part of the cause of the current, con current conflict? Maybe we have on, on both sides, on the, on the Muslim side, the, the religious teachings that go on on a daily basis that that continue the cycle of hatred that that a military solution cannot cannot address and on the and maybe on the on the Christian or United States side would be the things that you've already mentioned as the we refer as the axis of evil and all the slang terms and things that 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 you have probably the greatest experience in solving from the old days of the civil rights conflicts and, and things, what well, what can we do about not, the cause? I'm, so we I'm don't not have to quite do this sure where to start, except you don't start with Turkish troops running around the Kurds. That's where you don't start. That's just insensitive and insane. I mean, this idea of trying to have the Turks with the Kurds doesn't quite stand the reason. Secondly, is the, is uh, as some American troops are now saying in their demoralized state, they're running out of the capacity. They run up in people's houses that they don't know, with whom they're not angry, whose grandfathers climbed the walls in fear, whose women scuffle to put clothes over their bodies, whose babies are screaming. We're running out of the capacity to engage in a war that is that senseless. Uh, and those who sent our youth into that situation bear a great burden uh, on their legacy. Uh, I can only say today that religions, even in Iraq, can coexist. But now we have unraveled centuries of, of fear and hatred and violence and competition and, and conflict and uh, we, we broke the wall down, and we can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So we must get somebody who can. I do not know at this point of a more credible force that could be heard in that kind of Ba'ath, uh, Kurd, um, Shiite combination 
than some combination of UN forces. It's certainly not the US forces. It's certainly not a US British coalition. That would not ever bring peace and stability in Iraq. We're gonna take two more questions. We're already running late, but Reverend Jackson is way too good, so we're gonna keep him here for another two questions. Yes, sir. Thank you for having that opportunity then. Um, Reverend, in your, um, I'm Mark Vermeerlo from OSE from the Netherlands. Uh, in your introduction, you made a plea for the European countries to join in the problems the U.S. has in the Iraq. What makes you believe that would be a solution in, let's say, the next six months or the next year, given the fact that, um, in fact, the Iraqis or who are, whoever they are, are attacking the UN, uh, are attacking the Red Cross, and in fact are attacking everybody who's at this moment in their country. Thank you. See, w one reason why other countries must help is that the US may have started this fire for all of us that are living in this house. So we really don't have the option to say, I told you so, gotcha, the US has a problem. As this war intensifies and this region is embroiled in it, which was always the Tenderbox region in the first place, this war has the capacity to be as engulfing of world attention and priorities as Vietnam ever was. So we, we really, even those who are angry with the policy and angry at the policy makers don't have the option to say them, we must find some way to stop that fire from spreading because the wind is blowing. Right now the attacks are more or less staged and contained in Iraq. Those attacks may not remain contained in, in Iraq. And so none of us are safe. So all of us are safe. We had reason to fight terrorism in Afghanistan. We didn't have reason to preemptively attack Iraq unilaterally. But now we're in, the uh, U.S. took us in the mess. But we must come out. Because it's just like when President Bush came here, rather than talk about mutual beneficial trade and the, and the Burmese uh, refugee crisis and malnourished people, rather than talk about some investment for universal education, he came talking about some plan to build an, uh, uh, military access uh, and more money and more guns. I mean, we're being pulled into a sinking hole that does not make us more secure militarily or economically. Last question. Uh, yes, um, Reverend Jackson, uh, today there's a gubernatorial elections going on, I believe in three states. In uh, Kentucky, there's a big controversy. The, the American Civil Liberties Union was unsuccessful to try to stop the uh, Republican Party from bringing in watchers in, in certain black voting districts in Kentucky to intimidate um, the voters, which I think they were taking um, leads from what happened in the uh, Florida election that gave Bush the uh, presidency. Do you, do you find this as a disturbing trend? And one other question, um, do you have any comments about the neo neoconservatives who basically are ruling the roost in our foreign policy today, who in three very public letters from the, as early as 1992 declared that they wanted to uh, invade Iraq from 1992 three times. Do you have any uh, comments about well, these people? They are Thanks. not neoconservatives, they are ancient conservatives. Ancient, they ain't new, they're ancient. Uh, and they are driven by the kind of ideology today that had us in the 1863 to 65 conflict. It's almost a revival of civil war lines between those who are with the Union and those with the Confederate. And by and large, that element has uh, supremacist ideas at home about race and religion and foreign affairs. That kind of uh, agenda and uh, race and religious supremacy uh, extends into our foreign policy. 
and, and logically leads to isolation. A world that will not accept that. It's like saying to France and Germany, we'll not give you the privilege to come die with us and pay for the dying, but you can't sit at the table to determine uh, the resources because Bechtel uh, uh, and Halliburton already has that part down. That is, that's some old Baghdad Bob. That's some old comic, comic Ali. That's ridiculous. And the world is saying, is saying no to that. And uh, what is, again, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the, these right wingers are, are devastating in the ideology. Now, the pattern, the, the attempt to stop, to control or stop blacks and browns from voting is just an unending pattern. 1965, African Americans finally got the right to vote. Hispanics got the right to vote. Took us to 1990 to end the gerrymandering, annexation, at large, rule purging schemes that undercut the impact of that vote. Then 1990, they tried to use census count to undercut the impact of the vote. In 2000, they stopped the count and disenfranchised that vote. In Texas, the redistricting disenfranchised about the two million black and brown voters. In Texas, we have been the congressperson of their choice. In California, the recall was a massive uh, disenfranchisement scheme. And so that remains uh, a big battle for this because uh, Clinton, Gore, and Bush got more white votes than Clinton. Clinton got more white, black, and brown votes than they got. So by the margin of our participation, presidents, senators, and congresspeople are determined. So the right wing sees it as their mission, it seems, to, to maintain schemes of disenfranchisement or discouragement. And so uh, I'm not at all surprised that in, in uh, Kentucky, not just that, that would be attempts to intimidate that vote. Do you remember night in year 2000 at the height of the debate about the Florida debacle, the Secretary of State Harris uh, hired a team from Texas to, uh, to go through uh, those who had served their time in prison, ex-felons. Mm -hmm. Because there are 500,000 ex-felons in, in Florida who lost their right to vote. Disproportionate black and brown. They've served their time, they're back in the streets and can't vote. And in the overreach, they, thousands of blacks who had never been to jail had to prove that they had not been to jail to get their, to get their vote counted. With me? Again, the disenfranchisement scheme by the margin, if you just take 10% of the 500,000 that got sent those letters, 50,000 whose vote was chilled, that's more than the margin that Bush won farther by. So there is, with all the focus now on uh, Iraq and the imagery of General Brooks and Sanchez and Condoleezza Rice and Powell and, and, and Clarence Thomas, you see these faces in politics and you see the athletic faces in, in the ball games. But the quest for racial justice and gender equality and workers' rights in America are constantly under attack by these ideologues. Uh, we are realizing a level now of polarization that we have not known in my lifetime. NAACP has met with every president since Warren Harding and can meet with this president. Organized labor, closed door. President Bush took a five trip, safari trip to Africa, um, and never met with the Congressional Black Caucus before he went or when he came back. So now, my, I'm not despaired about it, I'm clear about it, and I hope to work very vigorously next year to create the kind of America that all of you who are over here will be proud of, and that, that sense of buoyant optimism and radiant joy that is the best of America will again be in the air all over the world. Thank you very much.
thank you very, very much. Reverend Jackson, thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you here. Thank you for your speech and your answers. Uh, I would like, uh, on behalf of the club, to welcome myself, the royal couple of Liechtenstein, Prince Alfred and Princess uh, Alberta. Uh, Prince Alfred is going to be our next speaker uh, on behalf of the International Peace Foundation on November 12th. Thank you very much for coming to the club.